Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this digital Middle Eastern FPNA board meeting. Today we will talk to you about the power of FPNA scenario planning. My name is Hans Gobin. I'm an international FPNA board ambassador as well as FPNA trends ambassador, and today I'll facilitate the meeting for you. Um, just for information, today we have all over 600 um, registration and we also have a great uh, panel um, and great discussion points for you. So moving on. Um, this is the discussions points we've had in previous meeting in Dubai, so please have a look at it at your own leisure. Let me share with you what we have on the agenda for you today. So today we'll talk about best practice scenario planning and how we can make the most of technology for this, forecasting in uncertain environments, um, scenario management, how it has to be quick, multidimensional, and collaborative, evolution of FPNA scenario planning, a case study, um, FPNA recruitment in Middle East, we will go through conclusions and recommendation, and then our QA session. It is now a good time for me to introduce to you our esteemed member of uh, the panel. Um, and to start with, um, I would like, first of all, I'd like to um, invite all of you members of the panel to switch on your webcam. Um, and I would like to start and introduce um, Arun, first of all. So Arun Sadagopan is director at uh, Mir for JEDEX. He recently joined um, JEDOX and has had five years as territory sales manager for UAE and Oman at Oracle. Of course, Arun brings with him a lot of expertise in EPM and BI space since 2001. Lots of experience in selling, but mostly implementing EPM systems throughout UAE. Uh, Arun, great to have you with us today. Thank you, Hans. Pleasure to be here. And Arun will talk to us about best practice scenario planning and the use of technology. Thank you, Arun. Our next uh, presenter for today is Jose Nazario. Um, Jose is FPNA and CCAR Director, Global Consumer Banking at Citi. Uh, Jose joins us from New York today. He's a professional of more than 18 years of experience in leadership roles with lots of big companies, as you can see here currently heading FPNA at Citibank in New York. His responsibilities is long-term planning and stress testing CCAR, uh, and we will hear a lot of that from um, Jose today. Jose, great to have you with us today. Hans, great to, have, to be here as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jose will talk to us about forecasting in uncertain environments. Our next member of the panel is uh, Aravinda. Aravinda Tiwari, who's um, Senior Director, Finance, Business Transformation and Organization Effectiveness at IQVIA. Um, of course, uh, Aravinda is a qualified accountant, you can see there, has got lots of experience in different matrix reporting operation within different countries, uh, controllership, FBNA, uh, finance transformation, and building strong finance team. Prior to IQVIA, he worked at United Technologies, Genpak, GSK, and Tata. Um, and today, Aravinda will talk to us about scenario management, how it has to be quick, multidimensional, and collaborative. Aravinda, great to have you on the panel today. Thanks, Hans. Uh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Uh, Next person in the panel is Ram Kumar Balasubramaniam, who is Head of Finance Middle East at Barclays, CFO with more than two decades of uh, progressively senior uh, experience. He has led loads of uh, different teams in international banks with all sorts of responsibilities, strategy development, and is also an expert in driving business performance. A a analytical thinker, Telling the story is a great thing for uh, Ram Kumar, uh, and today he will tell us all about evolution of FPNA scenario um, planning, and he'll talk to us about how he's put that into action as well. So, Ram, great to have you with us today. 
Thanks for having me, Hans. Look forward to discussion. Finally, we've got uh, Bindita Bakshi joining us from Dubai. Um, Bindita is consultant uh, within the finance and accounting team for Michael Page, specializing in recruitment across retail, pharma, FMCG, uh, professional services, and hospitality within UAE, KSA, and Northern Gulf. Uh, Bendita has got an engineering background uh, with a master's in business management and uh, is been with Michael Page for three years now. Bendita, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Anne. Good to be here. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got a great panel um, for you today and they've got a great presentation as well for you. Uh, panelists, if you can switch your webcam off now, I've got a few slides before we start the meeting. Um, thank you very much. So we now have 27 boards, as you know, in 16 countries and four continents. Today we're bringing together the Dubai chapter and of course uh, the surrounding Middle East countries. Just so you know, we've got uh, 48 countries, people from 48 countries joining us to, uh, today. Uh, also to mention that uh, we are now doing best practice workshop in fp &A consultancy as well on the demand of our members. Uh, just a reminder what the uh, digital FPNA board uh, meeting is about. So it's a 90 minutes webinar. There is four polling questions. So please vote uh, via the uh, voting box. Uh, there's a Q&A session um, at the end, but you can ask your question as from now. Please ask questions. The one we can answer today, we will. The one we can't, we will answer via email. You can network with us via LinkedIn. Uh, handout is available for you to download today or you will receive a copy of the recording and presentation within two days after the meeting. Uh, please remember at the end of the session there is a survey if you can give us um, your feedback and future discussion point you would like to see. Uh, these are thank you slide to our sponsor. Our technology sponsor today is Jedox. Uh, thank you very much Jedox. Uh, we know Jedox as the modern corporate performance management platform. So thank you very much, Jedox, and our global recruitment partner, Michael Page, whom we all know one of the world's leading uh, professional recruitment consultancies. Uh, before we start the presentation, I've got a few slides, but I'll skim through them because we haven't got that much time. Just to highlight to you that uh, we've got the predictability span here, uh, and this is time. So beyond that sort of time this is where traditional forecasting method doesn't work anymore and you've got a few scenarios described to you at the bottom and this is uh, all adapted by uh, from Paul Shoemaker. What are the differences between traditional approach uh, to planning and scenario management? Uh, very important to concentrate on the scenario management piece here and all of these points will be touched by our speakers. So please take some time and, and read them through. And finally, I'd like to introduce to you our latest attempt, or this is a taster because the paper hasn't come out yet. It is coming out at the end of the month where we've got an updated FPNA maturity model. Um, and if you look at that leading stage, which is where everybody is trying to get to, um, uh, there are key points there highlighted in red for you to consider. And a lot of them is around scenario planning. You will see multi-dimensional scenario analysis in that red box there. Three-way modeling, uh, leading analytical drivers, predictive and prescriptive analytics as well. So please have a read at that and look forward to our paper that is coming out at the end of the month on this. Right. It is now a good time for us to go into our presentation itself. And the first one will be from Arun Sadagopan, who is Director Mia at Jedox. Today, Arun will talk to us about best practice scenario planning and the use of technology. Uh, Arun, over to you, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Hans. Um, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'll be presenting uh, how technology can help you and your organization manage uncertainties uh, through scenario planning. Now, the word uncertainty or disruptive events uh, is not a new thing for organization. 
if we look into the past, some of the events which led to the crisis of the organizations were the dot-com bubble, uh, the 9-11, and uh, the 2007 global decision, and of course, the pandemic. Now, before we get to know how scenario plan would actually help you uh, in managing these events, uh, let's just look into how is it different from a crisis, uh, how is it different from a standard plan? Now, in my next slide, I would explain to you the difference uh, between the crisis planning and the standard planning. Uh, thank you, Hans. Um, now, if I can list out the basic differences between a crisis planning and the standard planning, um, the first would be the periodicity and, uh, of course, the frequency of updates. Now, uh, when we generally we do a standard plan, we do it for an year or we do it for a couple of years or three or five years. Uh, However, in crisis planning, we do it for a shorter uh, time. Um, then the next thing would be of uh, standard planning tend to have a longer term horizon than the crisis planning. And uh, uh, the drivers and the assumptions that we consider while we're building our plan are quite different from uh, the standard plan and the crisis plan. Now, in general, when we build a plan or for a standard planning, we look into a lot of an internal historical data. Um, however, in crisis planning, we not only look into the internal data, but we also look into the external factors which might influence uh, our forecast or the outcome. So the main objective of the scenario plan is to give you an alternative view of the future. It will actually help you to uh, run on the fly what if analysis uh, by answering some of the questions that you might have, uh, like uh, when will the pandemic be over, or how will the recovery will look like, and what is the change in my customer behavior, or will there be an impact of, on my uh, on my supply chain, or will we run out of cash? It, it doesn't matter. So whatever the questions that you have, you can just get the answers out of the what if analysis. Now. In this slides, uh, let's take an example of, uh, let me take an example of a coffee shop uh, who also had an um, uh, impacted by the pandemic like any other industry. And uh, they, they, I mean, uh, their usual business has been a dining, but uh, now with, because of the pandemic, the dining is not there. They need to look into an alternative model of either deliveries or it's going to be a takeaway cups. So if they would like to take the scenarios, and if they would like to plan for their, you know, uh, how their margins are getting affected, how, how their revenue are getting affected, if I can consider that example. So the first thing what they would do is to uh, is to set the objective and the scope of the scenario. So in this case, in this coffee shop, uh, in the coffee shop example which I gave, uh, the scope is basically to what if 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 I'm going to do a lot of takeaways, uh, if I'm going to sell more takeaways, or if I'm going to have more of a, uh, more of a delivery. So these are two different scenarios that they can consider. And the second thing which you need to look into is the time frame. Uh, the time frame is much more important because this is something which you feel that this is your predictable span, which uh, Hans was talking about, that in which that you're actually looking into uh, building your scenarios. Um, this is a coffee shop example, similar to your industry. If you are into like some of the examples here, uh, if you are into transportation and logistics, then oil prices impact plays a greater role uh, in terms of your margin and playing with your margin. So you need to consider based on your industry. So once you have set the scope, I mean, once you have defined your scope at the same time, the time frame, uh, the next thing what you have to do, uh, which will be explained in my next slide, is uh, to know what are the drivers which could impact your forecast. Now, there are two drivers which could impact. Uh, one would be your internal drivers and the other one would be your external drivers. Now, funny enough that many organizations are very clear about the internal drivers which could be impacting their forecast or, or their outcome but they are not aware of their external factors which is influencing their forecast or influencing their uh, outcome so it's very it, i mean you should be very clear on what are the external drivers which could actually influence this is very important when you're building and when you're factoring in the uh, scenario plan now um, if we take the same example of the coffee shop, now it's a, it's a pretty new business for uh, them to get into a delivery model. So their external drivers would be, they do not have the delivery capability. I mean, nobody was prepared for that, right? So they need to either partner with uh, Uber Eats or Zomato, uh, or they need to build their own delivery chain uh, in which that they can actually serve uh, people. And their internal drivers could be, now if they are moving away from a dining into a takeaway model or a delivery model, 
uh, then they need to look into the speed in which that they can actually deliver. So, which means that they might need to have more than one baristas. Uh, technically, in in turn, in case of a dine-in, that we will have one barista because people come and spend more time enjoying uh, in the coffee shop. Uh, so the number of coffees that they serve is enough for one barista. But in this case, they need to factor in more than one baristas. So uh, it's very important that we know what are the internal drivers and what are the external drivers, and we need to know what is the relationship that they are actually playing. So once we have defined, once we have identified these drivers, then the next step in the process is to bring in the data. Uh, in, in bringing in the data, uh, this is where technology plays a key role. So you need to have a technology which is actually capable, at the same time flexible enough, to not only integrate with your internal systems, internal ERP systems, but also to the external factors. So, uh, because uh, if we take the example, uh, going back to the same example of the coffee shop, so we are talking about integrating with Uber Eats or Zomato. So your system should be capable to bring in the data, like where is the closest to drivers that is available so that they can deliver faster and all this stuff. And at the same time, if you talk about having more than one barista, it needs to it's integrate with your uh, HR systems to, uh, to bring in the barista's information. And at the same time, it needs to work into your procurement data. So the various drivers that need to be integrated. So your technology plays a key role in collecting all these data. Now, once we have all the data in place, now this is where we start to develop uh, these scenarios. Now, like I said before, the, the main objective of a scenario is to provide you with an alternative view of the future. So in this case that we have taken two scenarios, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, coming slides that you see that even Arvinda is talking about uh, why it's why is better to have more than one scenarios in place it's always a best practice to have more than one scenario because what we wanted to achieve is to have different views of your future how it's going to be there uh, what will be your impact and uh, so that's that's the objective of the scenario so do not waste time in in perfecting a particular scenario because there is never a perfect scenario uh, all you have to concentrate on is to bring a mechanism in which that you keep developing more and more scenarios. And uh, the other thing is that you need to document each and every scenarios that you are actually building in. What are the assumptions that you are taking? What are the drivers that you are taking in building these scenarios? And what is the time frame that you are considering it? Well, because the documentation is important so that you can actually compare between different scenarios that you might have. So now, finally, it's all about the technology. Technology is the greatest enabler in for you to have the scenario to be developed. Um, you can, you know, the technology should be faster and easy to use for you to so that you can develop scenarios in a faster way. Um, you cannot just wait for uh, building a scenario. Uh, your technology should not hold you back uh, for building a scenario. It's, it's, it's like you can't wait like three months or six months because at that time, your scenario would have completely changed. Uh, your technology should have an uh, real-time collaboration with across different value chain that you have and it needs to have an integrated planning uh, which would actually give you a holistic view of uh, from different departments in your organization so that you can actually build scenario-based forecasts and if you have this fundamental thing set then you can even bring in AI which can actually increase the prediction of your forecast and, uh, uh, and uh, potentially help you in managing these uncertainties. Um, that would be all from my end. Over to you, Hans. Thank you, Arun. Uh, great uh, example of uh, how to start, where to start, and and how to move along uh, that sort of process to get to, you know, uh, a technology-based scenario planning. So thank you very much for that. Can I ask our members of the panel, Jose and Aravinda, to join us and give us some comments on uh, on the presentation? Um, Jose, if I may, I'll um, start with yourself, please. Sure. So, so good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, all. Um, I think what what Arun mentioned is is really relevant, and it's relevant even more with the situation of the pandemic that we are all facing. Right? Uh, before, it wasn't um, so critical, but considering the situation, the scenarios that we all need to think about, it's getting more and more critical. And I think as we evolve and get out of this recession or this pandemic, we will even more develop this as we go along. Thank you very much, Jose. Aravinda, your comment, please. Yeah, sure, I would I would add on to what Jose shared. And Arun, thanks, thanks for this. But you raised a very good point on technology. Technology should not be something which should stop uh, anyone. I think it's a good, great enabler. 
And one thing uh, which it does good is that it takes uh, the scenario planning from qualitative aspect to dynamic simulation, which you know, which which really explodes uh, the quantitative flexibility. Even so I'm pretty sure Jose, when he is going to take through his slides, he gonna share us uh, that how quickly and what multi-dimensional um, approach they get when they use technology. Thank you very much, Jose. Thank you, um, Aravinda, for your comments. And thank you, Arun, for a great presentation. Now that we've heard from you guys, let us hear from our members of the panel um, via our first polling question. Um, and I'm just going, if you bear with me, I'm just going to launch the first uh, polling question, which is launch just now. So, uh, if you could vote, please. So the first question is, how would you describe your scenario planning model and tool? Uh, do you have any? Is it non-existent? Um, Excel, not driver-based model. Excel, but it is driver-based model. So all these drivers we've spoken about is existent. Uh, dedicated planning system, but it is not driver-based. And finally, E, dedicated planning system and driver base model. If you can vote, please, that would be great. So first option, non-existent. Second option, Excel, not driver base. Third option, Excel, driver base. Fourth, dedicated planning system, not driver base. And finally, dedicated planning system, driver base. I am now going to um, close the poll and I'm now going to share um, the answers with you. So 7% said non-existent. Uh, 27 Excel not driver base, 46 Excel driver base, 5% dedicated planning not driver base, and 15% uh, dedicated planning system which is driver base. Um, Arun, if I can come to you for a quick comment um, on what we're seeing here, please, Arun. Yes. Uh, well, it's it's not quite surprising for me. Uh, well, the need of the hour is to have uh, I mean a scenario plan. And uh, you can see that uh, the trend is more towards Excel because that of uh, the technology uh, that they are, I mean, uh, is, is, uh, is, much, is much more important for them to have uh, more in terms of a dedicated planning system. But however, we can see that many people are still with Excel because of the lack in the technology that they are using. Thank you. Uh, Jose, quick comment from you, please. Uh, I'm not surprised as well. Again, Excel seems to be the, the tool, even though it's, it shouldn't be, to do driver-based modeling. Um, but, but I think this trend will, will change. Um, to a more sophisticated tool, less sophisticated tool, I think things will change. Yeah, no, I, I, I think uh, we're seeing 20% um, here have already adopted a dedicated planning system. And I'm pretty sure that 5% is going to move on to driver-based. And 46% having using Excel, which is driver-based, is encouraging. I think what we need to make sure now is that those people uh, move on to, uh, you know, a dedicated planning system. So thank you very much for your um, comments, guys. Um, let me hide this and, and let us move on to our um, next presentation, which is on forecasting in uncertain environment. And for that, we've got Jose. Nazario, who is FPNA CCR, CCAR director at Citibank, who will talk to us about it. Uh, Jose, whenever you're ready. Sure. Uh, so uh, thank you so so much, Juan. So um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is forecasting in a certain environment. So if we could flip to the to the next page. So Citibank is in the financial industry, right? So as part of, unfortunately, after the economic crisis of 2008, 2009. The regulatory landscape in the U.S. and globally changed, um, and it changed to the better. Um, it, it was designed with new financial regulations to make the financial system more stable. As part of that change in the regulatory landscape, uh, all banks or major banks, there are some uh, differences between major and non-major banks, need to perform stress tests four times a year, so every quarter, and that has to happen ahead of the quarterly submission of capital to shareholders. Without these stress testing being positive, meaning we pass this stress test, and we would not be able to disburse this capital to our shareholders. Besides, again, making the, 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 the financial system more safe, this has allowed also the banks to become better prepared for future recessions. That actually, unfortunately, 10 years later happened again with COVID, 
as you can see in the left hand side of, of the page where you see the unemployment rate compared to financial crisis versus COVID-19. COVID Next page. So at City, and, and uh, stress testing is, is comprised of uh, eight scenarios that need to be run every quarter. Six of them are internal uh, out of those four sensitivities, and two of them are actually given to us by our regulators, the, the, in this case, the Federal Reserve Bank or the OCC. There's a base scenario, and there are stress scenarios with several magnitudes of uh, severity. Next slide. So how do we do this? So we have, and again, talking to the poll question that we had before, we have a system. We have an integrated system that was built in-house that uh, does all the forecasting for us. It's called Ruby from a PPNR perspective, meaning revenues and expenses and city risk from a cost of credit perspective. All of these systems use models, so they're driver-based models using macro regressions or business drivers like pricing or custom behavior. And then these two systems using actuals in these models produce what we call the CCAR submission or the stress testing submission. But it's not only systems that count for the success of, of this endeavor. The continuous engagement between <clears throat> business, FP&A, risk, and treasury is key. The stress testing or CCAR <clears throat> apologies, is embedded in our DNA. We think about this every day or almost every day, and the process is also part of our DNA. So we understand the risks, we understand the, the outcomes, we understand the sensitivities and the importance of each, each risk. So next page. Now focusing into Ruby. So Ruby does uh, is, is a system that uh, forecasts our balance sheet and our revenues and our expenses. It does that in less than an hour. It has 500 complex models in it and forecasts 60 months, so it's five years. So on the left-hand side, you see a screenshot, a very simple screenshot of the system. On the right-hand side, you see a screenshot of the models and you see all these nodes and these boxes that are literally the driver. This was an important part of our process before we didn't have it. We only had Excel. It was a very painful process, non-reliable, non-controllable. When we changed to Ruby and the model system that we have in, in there, it's faster, it's more reliable, it is auditable, um, so it is something that our regulators want us to have and we want to have as well from a flexibility perspective. Uh, next page. So just want to highlight a couple of key items besides technology that are key for us. Uh, the importance of a robust scenario design and understanding the business implications of that scenario. So on the left-hand side, you have very, a very simple uh, scenario design topics that we, we, we designed for this year. And again, of course, epidemiolo epidemiology is the first one. So you see there that we, in stress, uh, have designed that the, the, the cases will rise until first quarter of 21, and then there is no herd immunity until first half of 22. Economic reopening takes longer, and then the potential in political environment in the U.S. does not allow for additional stimulus. So it all starts there, and if you, if we get the right scenario design, we understand our risks. And taking that step further, what does that scenario design or, or the, those risks imply from a business perspective, from a customer reaction perspective? For instance, in the recession, people um, decrease their credit card usage because they don't have where to spend, right? They're at home. From a bank intervention, for instance, we, we reduce our marketing spend because we, we do not want to spend more in, in a recession environment. And a physical disruption, for instance, uh, higher branch costs due to enhanced cleaning protocols due to COVID. So these are just some examples of the importance of having a robust scenario design and also understanding the business implications of these scenarios. Next page. So another thing is importance of sensitivity. So as I saw, uh, said at the beginning, we have certain um, scenarios that are fixed certain uh, risks that we have identified. But we also want to understand what are, how sensitive are our results, kind of pressure test the results to some of the, the variables. So you see here four variables that we did some, some sensitivity testing, GDP, unemployment, interest rates, and credit markets spreads. And why are we doing this? We want also to understand at the margins what are the key variables that we need to look for and our impact, impact more our results, kind of pressure testing that. And why we want to do that is to understand if we have buffer or not in our capital 
to sustain those small changes or those changes that potentially come our way in the future. Um, next page. So in conclusion, what is stress testing? What is a stress testing process? It's a real-time process. It takes for us less than an hour. It's flexible. Uh, again, we can onboard whatever models we want with whatever variables we want, and it's multidimensional. City is in more than 60 countries, 60 currencies. I don't know how many legal entities, but more than 20 legal entities, and all businesses across the finance spectrum. It's important for us to identify the current risk and future risk and scenarios and business implication of these scenarios. It's not only a mechanical exercise, so it's important to identify these elements for the success of the process. This has allowed us to meet our enhanced regulatory framework and, and be prepared for future recessions. And it, has been, and it has been of extreme importance during the COVID pandemic since it has allowed us to adapt to this ever-changing reality faster and more accurate, if you, if you can say that, that as well. So, but we don't stop there, right? So what's next for us? Uh, we're already learning from the pand pandemic data because some of the behavior impact of government decisions and even impact of our own decision. So we have a playbook and, and, and an analytics on the way to understand what are these learnings and what we can do better. For that, we, we look at improving our forecasting models based on the above data, as well as potential uh, other pandemic-like scenarios or even other recession-like scenarios. And also continue to ingrain this process, this process even more in our day-to-day decision-making of the company because this is not a theoretical exercise anymore. This is a true exercise of, of uh, true uh, implications as we, unfortunately, we all live today in this, in this pandemic. And that's all I have. Wow, great example of uh, how uh, statutory requirements has made uh, the banking industry and led you guys through this uh, great journey, you know, taking one hour to do a scenario analysis and a scenario plan for all of this complicated business is it's just great to see and I'm, I'm sure there's so much we can learn from this today and going forward as well so thank you very much for that um jose uh can i ask uh, arun and aravinda to join us and uh, uh, give us their comments please arun if i can start with yourself yeah sure uh well it is surprising to see how ruby has been helping them and uh, that actually shows the importance of having a technology in place which can have it and then the my takeaway from this presentation is if you look at it the reason why ruby has been quite successful is because of the continuous collaboration he has with treasury fpna and everything which is actually helping him to build the models uh, on a real-time basis and uh, well banking has always been in the front run of uh, for all the disruptions in terms of digitally so uh, it's good to see that and uh, it's been a quite a good of learning actually Thank you. Thank you for that. Aravinda, your comment, please. Yeah, thanks, Jose. Uh, I mean, I think uh, one thing uh, uh, which has come very clear that it's, uh, and what Jose, you also shared that it's not a theoretical exercise. It's a pretty much a real exercise, okay? While you touched upon uh, very specific on banking industry, but we all know that, uh, uh, that most of the global banks could uh, withheld the liquidity stress test okay and that was just because they, they had this model okay mm -hmm. and they had the tools or they they had earlier worked on the scenario planning and they have been doing it uh and i think that that's that's a good thing i know uh, even beyond banking it's pretty much real it's not, not a theoretical exercise so thanks jose uh, to put that uh, practical inside into it no problem glad to Arun, Aravinda, thank you very much for your comments. And, and Jose, thank you very much for opening our eyes to, to the banking industry and how you guys do your scenario planning. Um, thank you for that. Let us hear from our uh, members now as to whether or not they do scenario planning at all to start with. I think that should have been uh, uh, the first question, but there we go. Let us find out. So uh, members, if you can um, vote, please. So our question is, um, uh, how would you like to describe your current FPNA scenario, scenario planning process? Is it non-existent? It is very traditional, worst case, case average, and long term. Or our scenarios are not multi-dimensional and time-consuming. Our scenario planning is real time, 
and the multidimensional. If you can vote, please. So A, non-existent, uh, B, very traditional, C, uh, not multidimensional and very time consuming, or D, our scenario planning is real time and multidimensional. I am now going to close uh, the poll and I'm now going to share um, the answer with our panelists. So 10% say non-existent, I'm very surprised. 55% very traditional, 27% uh, not multidimensional, only 8% say they've got multidimensional scenario planning and real time. Um, if I can ask our uh, members of the panel, um, um, Jose and Aravinda to join us. And if I can come to you, Jose, for your comment. Um, again, not not too surprised um, on, on, on this um, in terms of the very traditional aspect of, of, of it. Um, again, I, I think this will change. Again, but the same comment. I think COVID has made the importance of quick and, and multidimensional even more important than, than, than before, but not not surprised. Yeah, thank you. And Aravinda, your comment, please. Yeah, I think uh, not surprised. Uh, we have seen another uh, poll question as well, but uh, uh, at least uh, uh, one thing which comes uh, clearly is that uh, it does exist. It's traditional, you know, uh, on the maturity curve, uh, that's what we are talking about uh, across multiple industries. It's getting more real time and multidimensional. Uh, so I think it would change. It would change for sure and for good. Thank you very much. Yes, of course, if, if you see 27% uh, are already um, playing uh, scenarios, okay, they are time consuming, but uh, uh, they're not multidimensional. So 27 and 8%, they are really moving into that direction. It's it's just to make sure that that 55% move um, forward as well. So let me now hide this and we move on to our next part of the presentation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for voting. Uh, also to remind you, please ask your question via the chat box. So our next um, member of the panel to present is Aravinda Tiwari, Senior Director at uh, IQ. And today he will talk to us about scenario management, how it should be quick, multidimensional, and collaborative. Aravinda, over to you. Thanks. Thanks. If you could move to the first page. Thank you. I think uh, given, given a lot of participation from Middle East, uh, I would like to start my slides uh, with a quick reflection on oil price. I think if we, uh, talk about scenario planning uh, and we move back to March 2020. I'm not sure uh, any one of us would have thought that uh, oil would drop to single digit or even negative uh, in the spot. And at that point of time that uh, when we reach March 2021, it would be higher than pre-COVID levels. So that's, that's the uncertainty in which uh, we work. Uh, and especially talking about oil, I think it's worthwhile to mention uh, that Shell was, uh, Shell uh, uh, way back in 1970s were the first one to uh, put commercial use of scenario planning. Uh, uh, before I move for, for further, I mean, uh, it's very, very important to know that scenario planning is pretty much a journey to create a storyline. Uh, as a torchlight to uncertainties, because the future is quite uncertain. Uh, moving to the next page, please. I think uh, Jose and uh, Arun uh, touched upon very specifics. Um, so uh, what I would do here, I would quickly take you through in a single uh, screen uh, shot. Uh, that what are the steps? I mean, we, we all need to know the workflow, how, how uh, standard scenario planning should work. I think uh, uh, when when you start the journey, I think the very first uh, step is uh, uh, to identify issues, uh, define the scope and the time horizon. Uh, why time horizon is important uh, as um, Jose, as well as uh, Jose touched upon that they do it for 60 months, okay. Uh, so mostly uh, when we talk about scenario planning, it's uh, mid to long term. 
uh, we should not confuse it uh, with what if analysis or forecasts, uh, which primarily are uh, not multidimensional and for a short duration. Once uh, uh, you, you have defined your scope and time horizon, uh, the next key step is to identify, uh, the, define the key drivers. Now, here it's very, very important that these key drivers can be internal as well as external. I would take you through some of the examples when we talk about what is internal as well as external drivers. Uh, but the key thing there, again, when you define key drivers is to establish the relationship or a correlation factor there. Uh, the third step, uh, which is very, very important, uh, I think we live in a world uh, which is surrounded by data and data in all form. It can be qualitative, it can be quantitative. So it's very, very important uh, that when you are working on collecting or analyzing data, that you uh, try to reflect it uh, against uh, the scenarios uh, which, which you're going to use. And so it's very, very important uh, that the data which you collect here becomes part of uh, your scenario designing process. Uh, the next step uh, which, which you undertake is uh, uh, once you have collected data, you uh, try to create or develop scenarios. Now, this is a very, very important activity because uh, uh, that's where you would spend a lot of time working uh, uh, cross-functional team uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, putting down a very cohesive and logical scenario, okay? And you have to put a narrative description to your scenario. Uh, uh, and then you have to test your scenarios against the quantitative and qualitative data. Once you have done that, uh, this is the time wherein you come and start applying your scenarios. Uh, the key thing here, uh, which is uh, very, very important, that uh, once you start applying your scenarios, your task force should come clearly and they should put a action plan or a contingency plan. So uh, if, if you have a particular scenario, what would happen if, if uh, uh, you had, I mean, mostly you would try to put a uh, low, mid, high probability scenarios, okay, uh, on, on a particular scenario. So what the action plan would be there? What what would be the contingency plan? So that's very, very important uh, to, to put it right up there. Uh, and then once you apply your scenarios, uh, then your forecast, your budgets, your strategies should uh, align around that. Last but uh, most important, I think it's not a one-time exercise. So once you have uh, uh, put your scenarios, uh, you have to maintain and update them yeah, because you have to make keep them relevant uh, be, uh, given they are uh, long-term. So how you do that? I think uh, you have to put uh, the performance uh, uh, indicator, the, uh, the KPIs, and then make it part of your dashboard. It might be your monthly dashboard or quarterly dashboard. That depends upon the organization, but I think you have to uh, maintain and keep them updated. Moving to next page. I think uh, I am not referring to a card game here but it's very, very important to understand that once you do all the activities and you come with multiple scenarios, those scenarios are pretty much cards which are handed, to, handed over to you or your organization. But we all know that we don't need 52 cards to win a game. We, we just need four or five of them uh, to win a game. And I'm mostly four, okay? Four is a good number. I won't go with five. Uh, five is too much, four is uh, still better. So I think uh, uh, it's, it's very, very important that at this junction, uh, once you have uh, found out multiple scenarios, you shortlist them and move from scenario planning to scenario management, okay? So you shortlist on these two to four scenarios uh, the other thing is that there is no perfect scenario. If you move for perfection, there is all probability that you would end up spending a lot of time there. Uh, rather than uh, once you have shortlisted your scenarios uh, uh, to these two and four, you straightforward move to scenario management. And what you do, you, you put a task force there, okay? And always remember that it's not a one-time activity. Okay, you, you have to keep on uh, adjusting or recasting your budgets uh, you know, under each scenario. And as I shared earlier, that it's very, very critical that you uh, maintain and update it as, as you move forward. Moving to next slide, please. 
uh, I think it's uh, one question which uh, you should always keep in your mind that uh, it's uh, what it is. I mean, it is pretty much an art of storytelling, okay, which is based on scientific methodology of uh, uh, designing scenarios. So uh, you have to be very, very clear. So when we talk about do's, I think the first uh, important thing is that it must have senior stakeholder uh, commitment, senior management commitment. Okay, once you have done that, you should define your assumptions very clearly. Okay, and you have to define relationship between drivers. Your drivers should not be isolated. Okay, uh, when we talk about multi dimensional scenarios, uh, even if you take uh, uh, any, any impact of a geopolitical or food or internal or external driver, uh, you have to pretty much put a, a clear relationship there. Okay. Uh, I think uh, you have to indicate KPIs, which becomes part of your performance dashboard, and you should refresh your scenarios uh, uh, regularly as the current event uh, plans out. Uh, I think uh, uh, one other thing which is very, very important is that uh, uh, you have to spend a lot of time or you have to spend energy on material differences, not going on smaller uh, aspects. Okay, so that's that. Usually that takes a lot of time. And finally, it's a pretty much a collaborative exercise. Okay, so you have to have team members who come uh, from different functions. So maybe your HR, maybe your production guys, if you are in manufacturing, your engineering folks, if you are in services, again, you have different departments who have to come and work along with you. So it should be a core task force. Uh, uh, which which works uh, and helps you uh, in creating or telling the story. Uh, uh, the telling the story is a very, very critical part here. When we talk about don'ts, I think uh, uh, one thing which is there is that a lot of time, uh, uh, even when you are part of task force, the team members jump to the issues, okay, and uh, or conclusions, okay. I think they have to define the issues first, okay, and then develop scenarios. It should not go with any preconceived notions. Uh, the other thing, it would be very tempting, but don't end up developing too many scenarios or attempting to uh, deploy a perfect scenario. I mean, perfect scenario does not exist. Uh, we are talking about uncertainty in the future uh, and nobody is holding just a ball to predict that. Uh, I think, uh, uh, and uh, I mean, one more thing which is very, very critical that don't fall in love with the scenario which uh, uh, has become irrelevant, okay? I mean, that's, that's very, 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 very important. Moving to next slide, please. I think uh, this list is not uh, exclusive or exhaustive, uh, but I think uh, we have tried. I tried to put some some of the examples when you are working uh, on your scenario planning exercise. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, when we look at uh, the poll results, uh, there are few who have uh, not looked at multi-dimensional approach or who, who does not have uh, the core framework. So it's very, very important that what kind of uh, issues when, when we look. So uh, as I shared, I started uh, my slides that uh, when we talk about Middle East, oil is uh, uh, the primary issue. I mean, the impact of oil uh, really uh, changes the strategy, okay? So it may be that what would be the impact uh, on your broader strategy if the crude price is uh, below 50, above 75, or uh, if it goes above 100. I mean, I know a lot of people think that it won't go above 100, it may, okay? Uh, but it all depends on future. Or it, it may be... Uh, 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 a lot of time in most of the places, uh, what is the impact of uh, dollar uh, flux, uh, on your uh, emerging market currencies? Because that's where you see that uh, uh, big impact coming on your, your raw material prices. Even even though, I mean, from reporting perspective, you uh, you report on constant uh, exchange rate, uh, but it does impact when when you look at your uh, raw material or input cost. Uh, so th those are a couple of examples when we talk about issues. When we talk about drivers, uh, I think uh, Arun also touched upon some of uh, these examples. But if you look at external drivers, they may be around uh, what would be the GDP growth for your country, how about commodity prices, what would be the impact of technology, uh, technological innovation uh, if, you, if you are uh, working in any industry these days. So there is, there is a, definitely an impact. 
or if we look at internal drivers, it may be uh, your access to capital where you want to uh, put that, your market share, your product innovation strategy. So uh, as, as I shared earlier and as other panelists have shared that, it's pretty much uh, multidimensional. Uh, but at the same time, as Jose shared that, once you have your scenario done, development or tools which are there it's a very very quick uh, process uh, i mean sometimes it takes one or as as what he shared i know in different industries it works differently so that's from me hans for today arinda thank you very much uh, uh, you know thank you for sharing and the key highlights is you know for me is number of scenarios uh, but more importantly once you know the number of scenarios and you've done them is how you manage through them and of course, anyone that is irrelevant, you need to ditch and move on with, uh, from it. So uh, thank you uh, very much for that. And if we can ask the other panelists to join us now, which is uh, uh, Jose and Ram. Um, Jose, if I can come to yourself for some comment, please. Quick comment, please. Um, again, this, this looks very, very, oh, sorry, apologies. This looks very similar to what we have in, 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 in CD as well. So the issues um, resonate a lot, <laughs> to, say, to say the least. Uh, and again, the drivers are applicable for, for each of, of the businesses if they are the same or different, but uh, it resonates a lot with, with the banking industry in, in, in any other industry I've been on as well. Uh, Ram, your comment, please. Yeah, uh, three things stand out for me, actually. Uh, one is the methodical approach to scenario planning. Uh, that's very important. Uh, the second one is what he spoke of, the senior management buy-in. And I think that's very critical. And that comes from the organization's culture. So if there's no culture of sort of uh, data-based decision-making, uh, there is no use on embarking on a scenario planning journey. So senior management buy-in is very critical. Uh, finally, uh, telling the story, very, very important. And as FPNA professionals, we carry the flag. Uh, we are the only function that sort of speaks to all functions in the firm. So it is very important that we pick up this soft skill to be able to make sense of uh, the underlying things and communicate effectively across the firm. Thank you very much, Ram. Thank you very much, Jose. And uh, Aravinda, thank you very much for your presentation. Let us now um, move on and hear from our um, attendees today as to how they're running their um, process. So I've just launched the poll and the polling question is, how long does your scenario planning process actually take? Uh, is it run in real time, which is what we want? B, uh, less than one day. C, normally take a week to run. D, we can run scenarios, but it is very time consuming. Or E, finally, we are unable to run scenarios. So members, if you can um, uh, vote, please, that would be great. Um, A, scenarios are run in real time. B in less than a day. C, normally takes a week. D, we can run them, but it is time consuming, or E, unable to run any. So I am now going to close the poll, and I'm now going to share uh, my screen with the panelists and yourself. So, um, wow, 0% have said it is run in real time. 12% less than one day. 38% about a week. 29% we can run them, but it is very time consuming. 20% we can run them um, and, um, sorry, we are unable to run them. If I can ask uh, the members of the panel to come and join me, please. Um, I have um, Ram and Aravinda. Aravinda, if I can start with you, please. Can I have a quick comment from you? Well, uh, yes, I think uh, uh, it's again not uh, very surprising the way we have seen results earlier. Okay, uh, the the uh, the thing which is coming uh, uh, very very interesting is that uh, no one has put that it's real time. Okay, and I think uh, uh, that's something uh, uh, which which should change okay I and mean, uh, I think uh, that's that's the need of all. But uh, more importantly, I think. Uh, if we see uh, in less than one day and a week, uh, that that itself shows that okay, at least it's uh, 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 it's it's within a week's time. Okay, so uh, but it should be real time. I, I would say so. I think uh, 
what I would suggest um, uh, everyone that uh, they, they should try to relook at it, uh, see the tools which, which has to be put in right place, the overall approach, I think. Uh, uh, so that would be my take on this. Uh, answer. Thank you. Uh, Ram, your quick comment, please. I think the results are on expected lines. Uh, what I assume is behind this is the systems are not integrated, uh, which is causing the delay and the adoption of technology is slow. But it's good to see at least 50% of uh, everybody who's answered says they're able to run Selenium appliance effectively, though it may take up to a week, they're running it. But the 20% at the bottom not running the scenarios is very um, worrying because it is very critical uh, that we're able to see what is ha going to happen in the future based on various variables. Uh, we really need to close that gap. Absolutely right. I think we need to push that 20% to move into at least scenario planning of some shape or form. That's very important. So thank you very much both. And, and let me how hide this now and let's move on to our next uh, bit of the presentation where we will talk about evolution of FPNA scenario planning. Uh, a case study from Ram. Uh, who's head of finance, uh, Middle East and Barclay. So Ram, over to you whenever you're ready. Uh, thanks, Hans. Um, I will discuss uh, the evolution of scenario planning in banks and uh, how it's changed over the years and actually pick up a very relevant case study that all of us can sort of relate to. Uh, banks have always been at the forefront of uh, scenario planning and management. And why is that the case? Uh, it's not really by design or by default, but it's a mix of both internal and external factors. Uh, if I look at the regulatory landscape, and Jose spoke to this uh, very well in stress testing. So after the credit crisis, uh, banks were sort of mandated. So you have to comply with the rules and do the stress testing as needed. So that needs a lot of forecasted scenarios in the future. Uh, secondly, another change that has happened in the uh, regulatory landscape is the financial valuation of assets. So IFRS 9 valuation of assets uh, for expected credit losses specific to banks. So if you look at the future, what credit losses will you hold on your portfolio? Uh, factors are not only what is already in the system, but about through the cycle. How will you hold losses for the period in the much ahead in the future? And it takes inputs like GDP, unemployment, and also management strategy inputs. So that's something which has meant banks have had to do scenario planning any which way. Uh, second is the technology trend, and I think this is uh, very familiar to everybody. Uh, banks are no more the brick and mortar buildings that we know. Uh, banks now have a customer approach, uh, which is based on digital channels. So with the evolution of digital channels and all the uh, new nice buzzwords that we hear, uh, that Arun also mentioned, like artificial intelligence, machine learning, and RPA, it has meant that the future scenario planning for banks has changed a lot. So it is active scenario management with the evolution of technology. On the third leg, uh, the business landscape has been disrupted. Uh, banks no more are able to lend and make uh, what I call the cream on the fee and the FX income because you have agile fintech players and they don't need to do lending to do payment mechanisms. So they have set up a new playground and they set the rules. So banks, if they have to be on a strong footing and compete with fintech players, are forced to do scenario planning to evolve and compete in the marketplace to stay relevant sort of. Uh, finally, maybe not only for banks, but for any firm with a high cost model and cost here, not only meaning absolute cost, but also cost of capital and trying to optimize the use of RWA. So banks are needing to be efficient. There is a need to be leaner and it's not just doing more with less, it's to do better with less. And to drive the return on equity. And so there's a need for banks to be profitable and to return a, to the shareholders a return higher than the cost of capital. So there's a need to reduce the cost of capital and also generate it. So banks are continually involved in scenario planning and all these sort of four forces have come together to ensure a very, very robust mechanism in banks, which actually do real-time scenario planning. On the next slide, I'll actually tell you how it works in banks. So this is a multi-dimensional approach. And what I'd like to call is four different buckets, right? So you have the drivers, the traditional drivers, everybody understands revenue drivers, cost drivers, and the risks that we need to manage as financial risks, as finance professions. There's a credit risk, there is the market risk, there's a treasury risk, and there's the capital risk, some of which, which also Jose covered. 
and there are other factors this is not only a pnl balance sheet and cash flow game right so this is across the firm so there are non financial risks to be considered um, there could be operational uh, risks modeling risks reg uh, uh, reg reputation risks and conduct and legal risks and finally where does the bank want to see itself in the future what are the strategy inputs so all these four and not everything is in terms of numbers but that can impact the scenario modeling with combined with external factors that I spoke of previously, it could be GDP and unemployment, it could be any factor of changes in the world, yield different scenarios. And there is actually, given the scenario output, there is scenario management. So how do you manage for a situation like this? And these need not be necessarily because of drivers, but given an output for a scenario, how do you manage the scenario? And banks have sort of perfected this. And here, uh, like Arvinda said, there is no perfect scenario you have to come out with scenarios and look to manage the scenarios if and when they should occur right and uh, i like to take a very practical example and it's something that i think all of you can relate to on the next slide so uh economist uh, daniel kahneman he said this and we always are optimistic people right we by definition uh see things as positive so we come up with situations and we come up with answers to the situations so we can seriously underestimate the risk of failure and come up with a situation that's only very hunky dory. Uh, but know what? The COVID-19 scenario was something which took everybody by surprise. Yes, pandemic scenarios have been modeled. Answers have been put together and there's a scenario management for that. But this kind of a pandemic scenario with a crisis driven by complicated and intertwined set of factors across the board, nobody had built for. I spoke of drivers in the previous slide and the risk that we manage every single driver and every single risk in the previous slide was impacted by the COVID-19 scenario. This meant actually all hands on deck. Everybody across the firm was involved. There was a serious crisis leadership team with representation from all functions. So there were inputs for all sorts of scenarios and particular scenarios were picked and acted upon. The, this is the first time we actually got to be part of something which is real time and to do a scenario real time and do the management in real time so it is not as if one follows the other with a lag it was active scenario planning and management continually evolving if inputs are changing and this has been the case over the past 14 months and today what we have the covid 19 scenario is still very much uh, alive right so we have a roll forward uh modeling uh scenario modeling on based on covid scenarios and waves uh, so how has this impacted the banks and what has it meant for banks uh i'll speak to it in the next slide uh this is something which i find very interesting uh, unlike fintechs uh, which we which i spoke of also banks have a reason for existence uh, there's a core value of a bank banks exist to serve real people support real businesses develop real economies and to contribute to communities. And this was reinforced significantly for our firm uh, in this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, very happy to state that the firm was able to stand up and support communities worldwide. It is able to help colleagues work remotely, but also help them to serve the customers very safely. Governments had different measures and a financial institution is the one which uh, it's between the customer and the government and it helps pass the liquidity to the system. So government measures uh, meant for corporates, meant for institutions, meant for small and medium term enterprises, all of which went through the pipe and helped businesses survive, helped the economy survive. Uh, when you look at retail uh, small time customers uh, or card holders, there were lots of payment holidays that the bank provided. There were a lot of fee waivers that the bank provided. That is the reason the bank exists too work with the customers in time of need. And this, uh, happy to state, ensure that we were able to deliver all this, but still continue to deliver a resilient performance with a return higher than the cost of capital. So uh, it's a phenomenal achievement in a year uh, with uh, such disruption, but all of this sort of came together because we had a firm-wise, firm-wide integrated approach. Like I said, not only financial inputs, inputs of all functions and across the board. So uh, some very significant learnings I'll cover on the next slide. And this uh, need not be specific to banks. Uh, it's applicable across the board. 
there has been significant impact on profitability of banks and what I like to call as the credit cost or credit management and cost of risk. Yes, there is an impact. Uh, the way we approach the client or deal with the client or maintain the relationship has changed, but it has gotten better. Would we have done this ourselves before, if not for the pandemic, but it is accelerating. Again, digital channels, active things like DocuSign, things where customers are involved, like EKYC, so many things which always were happening or would have been in the pipeline or would have, would have been a second go-to thing in place of, let's say, a wet signature or a procedural documentation. All of those things passed through the right risk forums and were approved in record time. So that meant the bank overnight became agile. Technology just accelerated and crashed timelines for implementing this uh, new uh, models. And that's really made the bank more uh, competitive in the marketplace. Uh, something very important, uh, which happened in our bank, may be applicable to other uh, firms also, is that we have a very diversified portfolio. We are an in, uh, what you call an universal bank with an investment banking arm, which has banking and markets, uh, with private bank, with retail bank, which has both uh, retail banking and cards. Yes, uh, there were some aspects of the business which are impacted more than the other. So let's say the retail bank or the cards business. but the markets business and the investment banking business really shone through. They had record bumper years, which meant having a well-balanced, diversified bank helped save the day for us. So it's very important and it'd be true for other industries which have a portfolio mix, which sort of plays out to the overall scenario. Uh, for the future, what does it mean for the banks? Will it mean that the operation resilience and business continuity management that banks have, uh, will it start uh, using the cloud technology? One doesn't, one will have to wait and see, but that is something which is in the horizon. Finally, something which you've seen really, really happen uh, with uh, remote working uh, and with the pandemic sort of, when it closes, I don't expect people to go back to work full time. It could be uh, people go to work a couple of days a week in, in place of every day of the week, right? So what does this mean for banks which have had real estate space lying unused for the whole of past one year? So it is a real question and banks have found it very profitable to let go of real estate space, which is not going to be used and save significant money to one of the cost items, which is the next after staff cost. So real estate is a significant cost base for every uh, firm out there. So that's, that's played out really. And what does it mean on the flip side? On the flip side, banks have had to make investments, investments in technology to provide the best in sort of experience for staff or for anybody involved in facing customers using the bank's technology. So that's meant investments, capex decisions, but something which will play out in the future. And these things have all been accelerated and would not have played out if not for the pandemic. So uh, while the pandemic had all its unintended consequences, these also have played out well in the banking industry. Uh, going forward, we still continue to do scenario management based on COVID. And this is based on inputs on based on how governments are going to react to lockdown, how quickly the vaccination program is going to roll out, and so on and so forth. So, Bob, thank you. Happy to take any questions later separately. Thank you very much, Ram. Um, great presentation. I think uh, you've shared with us your model. Of course, it is a, a bank model, but I see so many um, examples, so many learnings that all of our colleagues joining us today to, today can take from this and put it in their own organization. So thank you very much for that. I will now ask um, Arun and Bindita to join us and give us some comments, please. If I can start with yourself, Arun, some quick comment, please. Uh, sure. Uh, very good presentation, Ram. Uh, we get to see how, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that this is not only for the banks, but we also felt the same thing. Uh, the, when COVID hit, we, nobody was prepared actually in the world so because we our human brain has been wired in such a way we will not be prepared if an event is going to happen in, in the probability of one to thousand so one over thousand so that's why that nobody was prepared and uh, the scenario definitely we all went to the drawing board we planned for it and it helped and uh, it was actually pretty good to see how you were able to you know uh, i mean to have a have a, have a system in place in which that you were able to come back up uh, having a real-time scenario in place so it's a very good presentation Thank you. Bendita, your comment, please. Yeah, thanks, Ram. Um, 
Something that you said which uh, particularly resonated with me was the importance of scenario management. Uh, many smaller or local businesses weren't doing this at all in the Middle East. And for those who were, they stepped it up to a whole new level since we began to feel the impact of COVID. In fact, for a long time here in the Middle East, FPA was considered to be a luxury. Local organizations, uh, they did not have this in-house and large multinationals did it in a regional headquarter elsewhere. So as a result, uh, we see that the volume of candidates who specialize in scenario planning is still very small in the Middle East. However, candidates who are very good at managing uh, large volumes of data and synthesizing it are typically the front runners uh, in our shortlist. And I think there's now a greater appreciation for this as you know, the more scenarios you have planned for, the better framework you have when something totally unexpected like COVID does happen. Yeah, good, no, thanks. Thank, thank you um, very much. Great uh, uh, comments there, uh, panelists. And uh, uh, thank you very much, Ram. Let us now um, hear from our um, members on the last question or the last polling question of the day, which is, um, you can see it now. So how would you describe your current FPNA process? Is it static, not predictive at all? So we're talking about predictive analytics here. Have some predictive elements, so some drivers, um, fully driver base or D digital using automation, predictive analytics and machine learning. So you're talking that maturity model at that sort of leading stage. If you can vote, please, that would be great. Um, so how would you describe your current FPNA process? First option, st static. Second option, have some predictive elements, some drivers. Fully driver basis C and D, digital using automation, predictive analytics and machine learning. Um, I am now going to close uh, the poll and I'm now going to share um, the answer there. So 10% have said static, not predictive. 70% have got some predictive elements, 13% fully driver base and 7% uh, digital automation, predictive, and ML. Um, if I can ask Ram to join us and give us some quick comments on this one, Ram, please. Hans, this is a very, very uh, interesting output. Good to see uh, predictive and fully driver base, almost 83% and 70% and above having predictive elements. So that, that means while the population is not 100% which uses scenario planning of the population that uses, the, while it might take time, they are up to the speed when it comes to using predictive elements in full drivers. So that's that's very good to see. It's, it's heartening that those who have taken the scenario planning are actually doing it the right way. Thank you very much. It's it's really good to see at least only 10% is, is static. So thank you very much for that, Ram. And now let us hide this and uh, um, sorry, move on to our next um, presentation. So our next presentation is on uh, trends in the FPNA recruitment in Middle East. And to deliver that, we've got Bindita Bakshi, who's consultant with Michael Page. Bindita, if you would like to join us and uh, please uh, take it away. Thank you, Hans. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so over the next few minutes, I'm going to run through the key trends that we are seeing in the recruitment of FPNA professionals in the new COVID era. Um, on my next slide, uh, we will go through the shift in client expectations from a skills perspective. So two years ago, there was a demand for professionals who were qualified and had experience in large multinationals. Today, our clients expect to hire professionals who can demonstrate that they were able to put their education and experience to good use in 2020. They want to hear stories of new processes, new ways of doing analysis, which facilitated stronger decision-making through the tough times. So as a number one, scenario planning on an agile basis, the ability to change budgets and forecasts on a daily basis if required. So for example, our FMCG clients are building scenarios of a significant population drop in the UAE by Q4 this year, anticipating that the unemployed expats will exit by then. In addition to this, being able to flag business risks such as availability of cheaper substitutes. Whilst historically, the expectation was only to identify challenges, clients now want to hear your solutions. So in 2020, a lot of B2B food production companies, they realized that restaurants may not be operational at the same scale, 
and therefore they created platforms to tap into the B2C market and reach the consumer directly. Business transformation exercises, they've also become increasingly important. Adoption of a new system, restructuring of teams, or simply a successful move from a physical office to working from home. Candidates, they need to keep up with the changing technologies and maintain um, agility in the workplace. Something that Ram mentioned as well, multinational companies are you know, implementing a 100% remote working model to reduce fixed costs associated with a physical office. We are currently partnered with businesses that are a 100% online setup and they manage to pay their employees more than the local market rate because their capital expenditure is so low. Clients also want their FBA professionals to be more vocal and not just a doer. So it is crucial that FBA professionals can look beyond finance and translate to business terms. Um, and the ability to credibly communicate and influence decision making reduces the pressure of the finance function. And therefore, clients are interviewing candidates on this basis. So on my next slide, I'm going to talk about how this shift in client expectation from FPNA professionals is impacting the team structures. Firstly, teams are now leaner and they host more experienced professionals. This means there is an expectation to be both hands-on and strategic. Uh, the benefit is that it makes the information flow quicker and processes become cleaner. And this also calls for automation of the more mundane functions like uh, data collation or basic analysis. Linked with this, clients are willing to spend more on technology and digital transformation to bring FPNA up to speed with core accounting. Um, and they're looking to hire professionals who are more tech savvy and perhaps they've worked in multiple ERP environments. Finally, FPNA is no longer a luxury as it was perceived to be before. It's more of a necessity at a time you know, when decisions need to be made quicker and better. So from a sectoral perspective, we continue to see a demand uh, for FPA professionals within the FMCG sector, which has historically been a huge hire for this function, owing to the large market size and the perishability of products. Uh, this is particularly true within food manufacturing sector as the consumer tastes and demands they continue to change uh, over time due to a multitude of reasons. Another sector which has been very active is oil and gas, as it continues to see fluctuations from a pricing and consumer and industrial demand perspective, as well as the potential for lower oil prices uh, to become the norm over time. So on my next slide, uh, to conclude, uh, it's very important that FPNA professionals are able to demonstrate the impact of their work and the benefit of their analysis, in addition to the core skills and techniques, which are now just the minimum expectation. Clients, they want to hear your stories of your value adds through the tough time, rather than just your day-to-day -day responsibilities. And they want to hire communicators who can credibly summarize their thoughts and uh, analysis. That's all from me, Hans. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you, Bendita. It's, it's great uh, you highlighting the five key things you see in the, in the market in terms of skill set. And how this has changed over the pandemic is, is just amazing to see. Um, can I invite Ram to come and uh, give us some comments on the, uh, what Bendita has just presented to us, please, Ram? Thanks, Bendita. Very interesting to see that firms make savings in real estate and are able to deploy it to the deserving talent. Uh, so that's something very interesting to note. Uh, something I have myself noticed and you have indicated here also is the problem, solution and impact uh, thing for the teams. And FPA professionals have to be both um, value adders and problem solvers. And that's where the horizon broadens for an FPA person and it could widen and take over other finance roles as well. Something really to see there. Another thing is the intersection of technology and finance. That's something that uh, we are very interested in as we see more and more people being techno savvy as such while also having the finance fundamentals. That is to be able to take a situation, convert it in finance terms, but still be able to speak to the tech function to be able to deliver value for the firm. So that's an interesting thing to look out for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ram, for your comment. And th Bindita, thank you very much for um, a, a great presentation and telling us about the situation in Middle East. So uh, it is now for me to just do um, a quick conclusion. Um, members of the panel, if you would like to join me, and then we will go on to the Q&A session in, in a little bit.
So what we've seen today is um, from Arun, of course, the importance of technology, uh, from Jose, how that technology enables us to, uh, you know, scenario, scenario plan in, in less than an hour, scenario management from Aravinda, so make sure you've got those scenarios, two, three or four, but stick with the one that works, uh, don't become too close to, um, you know, one, if it's not relevant, ditch it and of course Ram has shared with us you know uh, within Barclays how things are happening at the moment but for me the key thing was it was not about um, the banking sector everything there was transferable to whatever industry you were uh, and and all four uh, presentations were uh, absolutely gave that same message. Bindita thank you very much for uh, taking us through the scene that we have within FPNA recruitment uh, within Middle East, we've got quite a few questions um, on that as well as uh, with everybody else. So, um, without further ado, let's just move us to um, to the Q and A session. And uh, I will start off with Arun. Arun, the question for you um, is, uh, of course, around tools. Um, what are the three major challenges in enabling real-time scenario-based planning from a tech perspective and of course the person has given you a few hints is it data quality is it integration of tools is it ownership what would you say is well i would say all three actually <clears throat> so all three is much more important for you to have a real time um, so obviously the tool has to be flexible so that you can add, it should have connectors so that you can integrate with different systems and uh, uh and the quality of the data uh, when we are integrating with it it's it obviously plays a key role so you, you mean um garbage in garbage out so it's basically that you need to make sure that uh you the data that you bring in is actually uh good so our uh, ownership also has a similar thing so all three plays a key role in uh, in a successful thing uh for choosing the two Fantastic. Thank, thank you very much for that, uh, Arun. And our second question goes to um, Jose. Jose, how does Ruby work in the case of not only analytics and model, but also real cases where strategic decisions in a far, foreign country has to be input in the country's head, for instance? How does that work? So, um, so the models will not capture strategic decisions, right? So if the strategic decision is in the past, yes, the models will capture that as part of a trend, and it, and it can't be in the recent past. It has to be more more uh, past left than, than recent. Uh, but if it's a future decision, what we how we account for that is what we call as an overlay, so an adjustment to the model to consider those strategic uh, changes. Or, in alternative, it could be also a, a market change that leads us to change something. So the models don't account for everything. So we need to do these, what we call overlays. Absolutely. So the, the way uh, with those is overlays. Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. Fantastic. And you will run it uh, in the same scenario modeling process, right? Exactly, exactly. So what we're doing is what we call the run of the model output. And then on top of that, we have those overlays. One plus the other gives you the final forecast. Uh, what 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 we're seeing here is obviously the flexibility of the model is the key thing. So whatever you hit at it, you you are um, uh, you can change uh, it to reflect. So thank you, thank you, Jose. Thank you very much for that. Um, uh, next question is to Aravinda. Aravinda, you talked about do's and don'ts uh, in your uh, um, presentation. Uh, one of them was indicate KPIs and refresh scenarios and assumptions on a regular basis. The question is, um, should KPIs be adjusted or be more static in order to serve as benchmark and a sense of true north? No, I think, uh, uh, see one thing which is there, that why we are putting scenario planning there or we move to scenario management there using performance dashboard, uh, that uh, it's it's uh, to look at it uh, uh, on a current view, okay, I mean, so where, where we are moving. So they can't be static, they have to be uh, dynamic and you have to re-evaluate, I mean, so it uh, uh, basis what the outcome is coming with. Uh, just look at examples, uh, I mean, even on crude, how it would impact uh, 
uh, your underlying uh, I mean cost or supply chain means uh, uh, which which may be because of any other drivers external drivers uh, then what would be there that your KPIs would differ okay so you have to keep them dynamic means it cannot be static means it can be static for uh, like to like comparison but when you work in uncertain time horizon uh, you have to uh, look at them in in more a dynamic way that, rather than static. Uh, absolutely spot on. The whole idea of scenario planning is because of these uncertain issues and events that we have. So, uh, you know, uh, it, it takes a, away this static thing completely from it. So uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, Ram, next question is for you. Um, interesting one, political, of course. How do you deal with adverse actual results as compared to worst case scenario planning and management pressure to paint a rosier picture? Not that it should happen, but no, no, it should not absolutely happen because the uh, real uh, thing is that we are conscience keepers, right? At the end of the day, if our job is to paper over the cracks, uh, then that's not helping at all. That's where I called out saying that we tend to be optimistic and we do not foresee a doomsday scenario, but such things will happen. And the better if that is called out and you're able to plan for that to come out of it, right? So then you have a management of that scenario to come out of it. So I, I definitely do not second papering over any cracks. The quicker the bad news travels, the quicker it's going up the chain to the top of the house, the better the decision making. So no, I'm very clear on that one. Absolutely. The whole idea is to, to get to that point where you know what issues you have, share it with management, and of course, look at how you deal with it going forward. That's yep. the key. Thing. So, so excellent. Thank you for that, uh, uh, Ram. And our final question for today is for Bindita. Uh, Bindita, thank you for sharing the key skills organizations are looking for in FPNA candidates in the Middle East. Um, what we've seen also is there's more of an ask with internally for FPNA to have more data science skills, data architecture skills, rather than just the traditional skills. Have you seen this from um, your uh, clients, for example? Oh, thanks, Hans, uh, for the question. So, yes, um, we are seeing an increased demand for data professionals um, across a variety of roles, in fact. So naturally in IT, but also across, let's say, commercial sales teams to accurately price products or within marketing to target the right consumer segments um, and, and corporate strategy even. Um, in finance, uh, there is a trend to hire data professionals uh, to facilitate better decision making on liquidity and uh, projections. But this trend has only started in large multinationals and in the more developed markets. Um, it is not something that you know, we are widely observing in the Middle East within FPNA yet. But given the rise in digital transformation here, I believe we should get there in the next uh, one to three years. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, members of the panel, thank you very much for uh, all these uh, answers. Very, very insightful indeed. Um, I've got a few more slides. If you would like to turn up your webcam, uh, we are almost to the end of this session. So I'm now um, going to share some dates for our diary. So um, if um, there we go. So what have we got coming up next? So coming up next, we've got the AF AFP Phoenix um, uh, conference, 15th to 17th of June. Um, FPNA Trends is doing a roundtable there, and Larissa and myself personally invite you there. So I think uh, when you get the slide, there's a link in there. So please uh, do click on it. That will take you through to it. And please join us. It'll be absolutely uh, interesting there. Another couple of dates for your diary, a uh, couple of webinars from FPNA Trends. So uh, first one, June the 10th, um, what does it involve to move to digital and data-driven FPNA? Um, again, the link is there if you just click it. Uh, the second one is June the 24th, and it is about myth and misconceptions of rolling forecasts and FPNA scenario planning, if you want to build up on this. So please join us. The links are there. Um, finally, uh, it is time now to say a big thank you on behalf of FPNA Board and FPNA Trends to our technology sponsor, JEDOX, our um, uh, recruitment partner, Mike Page, 
our esteemed member of the panel for their insightful presentation and answering all of the questions. Um, and of course, for all of the members for attending, giving us their insights uh, via the polling question, and also for the questions they've been sending. We've got lots of questions. We will get to them via email, even though we've only answered uh, five today, we will get to absolutely all of them. So please uh, keep sending them. And finally, here it is, join us, connect with us and learn a lot more um, about FPNA. So with this, ladies and gentlemen, we will conclude uh, the webinar today. When I close it, you will get a feedback form. So please give us your feedback. Hope you've enjoyed it. Have a good afternoon, good evening and good morning. And we'll see you in the next webinar. Thank you very much. Bye bye.